Uh, good morning, everybody. Great to see you. Thank you very much indeed for joining with us for worship here in New Mills, whether you're here or down in the hall or watching in later on from home. Uh, we really appreciate you being with us today at this holiday time, and of course, any visitors we have with us today are especially welcome. Just some announcements before we begin our worship. Uh, we're taking a break from our midweeks over the next two Wednesday evenings. The next midweek will be on Wednesday, the 28th of July. Next Sunday then, please book in for our 11.30 service as usual. The speaker next week will be Jim Lyons currently Ireland Director of the Faith Mission. Jim and Hilda have been worshiping with us over the past couple of years here in New Mills, whilst Jim has been in this role. So it'll be really good to have him lead our worship and to preach here next Sunday. Jim is just about to embark on a new ministry at Coleraine Congregational Church in August. Thanks to all who contributed to the Stand By Me emergency appeal, either directly or uh, by leaving a cash donation on our offering plates. And we managed to raise 355 pounds last Sunday, and then there were some late donations came in during the week, and we've also passed those on. So your support for Stand By Me uh, has been very much appreciated. Uh, I'm heading off now for a few weeks' break. Uh, basically in about two and a half hours' time. Um, and Richard will look after any pastoral issues that crop up when I'm away. And we also have some presbytery back up in place if Richard requires it. So you can get in touch with either Richard or with uh, Stephen. Stephen Sharp here, should anything arise. I'll be back uh, at the end of the month, but I am keeping my final week until the second week of August. So I'll be coming and going a wee bit for the next while. But I'm leaving you very capable hands. Then finally, just a few church family announcements. We want to extend our sympathy to the family of uh, Mrs. Pat McCamley. Pat passed away yesterday, and we want to remember her husband, Bert, her daughter, Amanda, very especially in our prayers. Richard will be taking her funeral, which is a private funeral, tomorrow morning. We also want to send our sympathy to Hetty McCune and her family on the passing of Hetty's mother, Mrs. Evelyn Irwin, on Friday. And I know that you'll keep Hetty very much upheld in your prayers in the coming days and weeks. You'll also have seen perhaps that we've taken delivery of a small table. This is to set offering plates on right in front of the pulpit. Uh, this has been donated by the Sargent family in memory of Billy, Billy Sargent, one of our elders who passed away last year. Now, we're planning a proper dedication of this wee table at a future date when the family can be present with us. But for now, we just want to express our sincere thanks to the Sargent family for their very kind memorial gift to the congregation. And then finally, we offer our congratulations to Frederick Cuttle, who was married on Thursday past to Claire Alden. We want to wish them both God's richest blessing for the years ahead as they set out in married life together. Well, today we're going to be looking at a really well-known Bible passage, and I would have to say one of my personal favorites, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 12. We'll read it a little later. But it really is a confidence-boosting passage for any Christian who is struggling a bit. It gives us great reassurance and hope to keep on keeping on. Let me set the scene, though, with these very similar words of reassurance from the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. Paul writes, "'Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. So this is Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Savior. He is our great hope. So let's join together. We're going to sing to His praise, Come, people of the risen King, who delight to bring Him praise. Let's stand and we'll worship God.
Well, we'll take a few moments and we'll pray together. Let's pray. Father, we have just sung praise to you because you are worthy to receive the highest praise we can offer. And Lord Jesus, you are our risen King. You are above all majesty. You are supremely more powerful, more glorious than any earthly ruler or monarch. Thank you that with such infinite power and sovereignty, you never abuse or corrupt or manipulate your power in any way to harm us. Indeed, your love, your, you love your people with a love that sent Jesus to a cross. You love with an everlasting and unfailing love. And we've just sung those words and how true they are, for his perfect love will never change and his mercies never cease. will follow us through all our days with the certain hope of peace. So, Lord, will you help us to truly grasp afresh today just how wide and long and high and deep is your love. Lord, forgive us for times when we have sinned against you and disappointed and frustrated and angered you, Lord, for times when we have recklessly and foolishly brought dishonor upon your name, for times when we haven't even cared that we've sinned against you. Lord, will you give us a fresh and renewed desire today to follow Jesus more closely. Fill us with your Holy Spirit today as we've come to worship. We've come to hear you speaking into each one of our hearts and lives from your word. Bless and enrich us spiritually by being here with you today. And may we go from here better armed and better equipped to serve you and to shine for you and to unashamedly tell others of your amazing grace. And all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Boys and girls, uh, Mrs. Bess is going to come now, and uh, with the help of some of the boys and girls, she's going to update us on some important prayer points, and they're going to lead us in our prayers for others. Thank you, Bob. Right. Well, good morning, everyone. In our prayers this morning, we're going to pray for Myanmar, following up on the information that Johnny from Stand By Me gave us last week. And then we're going to think about Ghana, because there's been some really good news to share with you and to pray about. And then we're going to come back home, and we're going to remember our Pray for Five initiative. So as the slide says, it's a little bit of this and that. And I've enlisted some of my young friends to help us pray today, Isabel, Kate and Joshua. So first of all, to Myanmar, just to encourage you, during the week we received an email from Johnny Farrell, who was with us here last Sunday, and he said, it was so good to be back with you all on Sunday. There's always such a warm welcome at New Mills, and we had really great conversations with folks after the service we definitely drove home feeling encouraged. Thank you. So, boys and girls, uh, whether you were in church here this morning or last Sunday morning or down in the hall or for folks watching online, if you spoke to Johnny or gave some of your money towards the Myanmar Food Appeal or just listened intently to what he said, be assured that it was deeply appreciated by both Johnny and Danny. Isn't it lovely to know that they drove home feeling encouraged? So today we're talking to God, and in a minute, Isabel is going to come and say our first prayer. I don't know whether anybody here, I'm sure there are some more, I know there's quite a few boys and girls down in the hall. Does anybody know What's the little four-letter word that we normally say at the end of a prayer? What's the little four-letter word that we say at the end? I, I can see, is that Jack down there? Can you shout it out, Jack? Amen. Amen. That was just brilliant, Jack. Well, 
Amen is a very short word, but it has a very deep significance. If we say amen with Isabel and with Kate and with Joshua here, whenever they say amen at the end of the prayer, it means that we are all agreeing with their prayer. So we need to listen to the prayer. And it means that we are calling on God to act. And it means that we are partners with God. We do our part in praying and in calling to him. And then he does his part. So if you agree with Isabel's prayer, and then with Kate's prayer, and with Joshua's prayer, maybe after they say amen, we could all say amen together. Let's not go, amen. Let's say, amen. And that will show that together we've listened to the prayer and we are in agreement with it and making it our own. So I'm going to first of all call on Isabel and she's going to come up and we're going to pray. Isabel's going to pray about what Johnny told us last week about Myanmar and stand for me. Right, Isabel, on you come. Dear God, thank you for Johnny and Danny who told us about how Stand By Me is caring for children in 11 countries across the world. We pray for the team in Myanmar where there is conflict at the minute. Please keep them safe as they deliver food parcels of beans, rice and oil to families which are hungry and desperate. Please watch over the children who have had to leave the children's village and stay with relatives. We ask that peace will be restored in Myanmar. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Isabel. Well done. Oh, there's Kate wants to give her a wee clap. Well, maybe give them all a wee clap or um, at the end, Emily. We'll wait to the end. Now, we're going to move to Ghana now for the next prayer. And the exciting news here is that three weeks ago today, three boys were rescued on Lake Volta. And I know we all know about the big Lake Volta where the boys and girls are forced to work um, against their will. So, and again, our money that we have sent over the years to IJM means that these rescues can take place. Now, this news was very exciting because the IJM team and the Ghana police and the Department of Social Welfare had all worked together to identify the traffickers and they developed a plan for bringing these three children here to safety. There was one uh, 10, age 10, one age 12 and one age 16. And this is the actual picture of them being brought to safety. Now, some of the people from the fishing village where the boys were working didn't want the boys to be rescued. They wanted to keep them as slaves and they threatened to attack the IJM team. But the police inter, um, they, they came on board and they protected the staff and the rescued boys. And to be honest, this wouldn't have happened a number of years ago in Ghana. So this is great progress. And in fact, one of the bad men who took these three boys against their will has been sent to jail for eight years. Again, that is great news. And this is the IJM model of rescuing victims, bringing criminals to justice, strengthening the justice systems, all being worked out in practice. So Kate is going to come up now and we're going to pray for... IJM in Ghana. All right, Kate? Dear God, thank you for how well the police worked with the IJM team to rescue three more boys who were forced to work as slaves on Lake Volta. We pray for the boys now as they are being looked after in a care home. Thank you that they are safe, receiving medical attention and education. We pray that you will help the IJM team to find their families. We ask you to help the IJM team to locate and rescue many more boys and girls who are trapped on the lake. Amen. 
very much. Now, we're going to have, Kate's going to give a wee quick wipe there, and then we're going to have Joshua. That's great, Kate. Thank you so much. And Joshua's going to come up now. That's lovely, Kate. Thank you. Just keeps us all right, pre-COVID. And if we just have our next slide, we're going to just have a quick reminder about our New Mills Pray for Five initiative, which took place in June Joshua, you and your mum and Oscar featured on our little video, but can you remind us all, just in case we've forgotten, what was all that about? We chose five people that we love and we prayed every day that they would put their trust in Jesus and turn their hearts to him. Yeah, that's exactly what we did, Joshua. Thank you for that reminder. We chose people, five people, that we would love, just as you've said, to see becoming part of God's family. And we promised to pray for them every day for one week. But we want to keep on praying for our five, praying that God will speak into their hearts. And maybe once a week, or maybe more than that, you could remember to pray for your five. Hopefully you've still got your little card. I keep mine in my Bible and the names can go on one side. And if you're not sure what to pray, just pray using the words on the hand, praying especially that God would bring salvation to your five. So Josh is going to pray now, just following up uh, on our Pray for Five. Thank you, Joshua. And we'll all remember to say a good Amen at the end. All right, thank you. Dear God, thank you that we can talk to you whenever we want. Thank you that you hear our prayers and love to listen to us. Please help us to remember to pray for our five people. We believe that prayer is so powerful and that you will answer our prayers. Help us to keep praying. We also pray right and now for our five people that you would help them to put their trust in you please help us to be brave and take any opportunity in your name we pray amen amen thank you very much joshua that was just brilliant and we'll just have a wee a wee clap i think for all of our three prayers this morning thank you folks Yes, indeed, that was great. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Pamela and all the three who took part. Now, it's great to have Richard back with us this morning. Richard's going to read to us our, our Bible passage. Thanks, Richard. Morning, everybody. It's nice to be with you. We're going to read, as Gordon said at the start, from 1 Peter, uh, chapter 1, from verse 3 down to 12. This is God's word. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. We thank God for his word to us.
Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Well, now we're going to sing again, and we're going to follow on screen uh, Catherine as she sings to us, and we'll sing along with her from Psalm 62, For God Alone I, I Wait in Silence. I'll not be shaken, based on Psalm 62. So let's stand, and we'll sing along. Well, we return this morning to the next in our short summer series on the first couple of chapters of 1 Peter. Last time we introduced Peter, former fisherman, now an esteemed church leader, along with the original readers of this, his first letter. They were a scattered mix of Christian believers living in modern-day northern Turkey, known then as Asia Minor, and many of them had suffered considerably for their faith because of imperial-sanctioned persecution under the emperor Nero. Peter's aim in, in writing this letter is to give his beleaguered brothers and sisters some hope and encouragement to persevere through their struggles. But he can't just tell them to close their eyes, make a wish, and hope for the best. He needs to give them some real grounds for hope, something to bolster them and to give them a certain confidence that better days are coming. So it's no surprise that in these verses, chapter 1, 3 to 12, Peter challenges them to build their hope on Jesus, 
on Christ, the solid rock. And he gets them really here to look back and to look forward and to look around. So let me frame this passage today around Jesus and his salvation, past, future, and present. And I'll look at each of these in turn. Firstly, Peter reminds his readers that Jesus' salvation is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets' preaching way in the past. And if you look down to verses 10 and 11 there, it reads, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when, they, when He predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. Now, these were prophets from Moses right through to Malachi, and the Holy Spirit revealed to them that a time was coming when Israel's Messiah Savior would appear and rescue and deliver His people. And these prophets would then preach and pass this truth on to their respective generations. Now, you'll not find Jesus' name referenced in the pages of the Old Testament, but He is certainly there. You'll find prophetic utterances to His birth in Bethlehem and to other milestones of His life and ministry. You'll see references to His character of holiness, His love, His power, His kingship. They foretold of Jesus being rejected and despised by many, that He would suffer unto death, but rise again in triumph and live eternally and come again to judge the whole earth. Now, we know that much of this has already been accomplished through Jesus' life and death and resurrection, which Peter and his contemporaries, verse 12, were first-hand witnesses of, and which they have been preaching about for the past 30 years or so. And some of it still has to happen in the future. But all of it was foretold by the ancient prophets hundreds of years beforehand. And Peter's saying here, basically, these Old Testament prophets were spectacularly accurate regarding the actual details and events of the Messiah's life his sufferings, and his future glory. Because the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, was in them and was revealing the truth exactly to them. Because, you see, the primary role of the Holy Spirit has always been to point people to Jesus, to work spiritually in their hearts, to expose their need, their sin and their need of a Savior, and to reveal to them that that Savior is Jesus. However, these Old Testament prophets had no idea when Israel's Messiah might come. Verse 11, they searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances of His coming. Now, if that was the case in their day regarding Jesus' first coming, it's a reminder, isn't it, to us of the pointlessness of trying to pinpoint times and dates of His second coming. The Lord alone knows that. Peter would later write, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord doesn't work to our time scales or to our agendas. So, our energy shouldn't be sapped by trying to work out the timings of when He might return, but making sure that we are ready for when He certainly does return. But well, Peter's main point here to his weary fellow Christians is that Jesus Christ, in whom they have believed and committed their lives to, isn't the product of their imaginations or some dreamt-up fantasy superhero. Jesus was and continues to be the exact same Jesus whom the ancient prophets spoke of beforehand, 
the same Jesus that Peter and the apostles have seen with their own eyes, preached his word, and staked their lives upon. The same Jesus whom even the angels of heaven worship and praise. Jesus is Lord of the years, the Lord of history. So let's take great assurance, great confidence in Christ today from these incredible, unshakable, historical truths. Hope in Christ built on past prophetic utterances, now completely fulfilled in Him. So secondly then, from the past, Peter now propels his readers right into the future. So look back up to verses 3 and 4. Even having been hounded and scattered literally all over the empire by imperial powers, Peter encourages these Christian believers to keep the focus on Jesus and to look ahead. And he exhorts them to be thankful. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because this Jesus, verse 3, has given them new birth. The new birth of of a healthy child is a uniquely special experience, isn't it? I'll, I'll never forget the incredible moments my own two children were born. Because new birth heralds new life, new beginnings, new hope, new relationship into which we fall immediately and helplessly in love. And Peter's really speaking here about our second birth, our spiritual birth, into a personal, living, loving relationship with Jesus. He's speaking of our being born again, as Jesus himself describes it to Nicodemus. Again, notice that Peter speaks of us being given this new birth. It's God's gift of His grace to us. Jesus made this relationship possible by coming down to us from heaven, fulfilling His Father's mission to save this rebellious human race through His sacrificial death on the cross. Because it was there the sinless Jesus took our punishment and paid our debt for our guilty sin. This is God's gift of grace lavishly given to us. The ultimate lifeline, which we either receive in believing faith and with humble thankfulness, or we dismiss and reject. And that's the gospel challenge which we hold out uh, every single week in this church. But Peter gives his readers even more reason to be thankful. He says, look to Jesus and look ahead. Look at the future implications of being in this current living relationship with Jesus. And he lists two of them. Firstly, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Undoubtedly, Peter's at this point reflecting back to that first Easter day and the days that followed when Jesus' resurrection changed him from a hopeless wet rag into a dynamo with spirit-charged zeal to serve God. Knowing that Jesus was alive again was the spiritual booster, the, the shot in the arm that he really needed at that time. And Jesus' own historically verified resurrection and His risen triumphant power fueled by the Holy Spirit, which permeates the heart of every Christian follower, is what gives us the strength to endure through the struggles of daily life. It's what keeps us from wandering astray. It's it's what inspires us to remain both faithful and passionate for Him the resurrection of Jesus. This living Lord has birthed within us a living hope and he, that He will keep us right through to the end on this earthly road and beyond. Because secondly, Jesus doesn't just give us a better future in this life. Verse 4, we're born into an inheritance 
which can never perish, spoil, or fade, and is being kept in heaven for us. The Old Testament Israelites in their day looked forward to the inheritance of the promised land of Canaan, Numbers 32. It was a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of plenty. But that Old Testament inheritance was pointing forward to a much greater inheritance that all New Testament Christians can look forward to, the promised land of heaven, an inheritance unlike Canaan that will never perish, spoil, or fade. In other words, the gifts and the blessings of heaven will last forever. They'll never decay or deteriorate. And we ourselves, clothed with new resurrection bodies, which won't grow old, they won't die, we'll thoroughly enjoy all these abundant, never-fading blessings. They will not spoil. Nothing in this new world order of heaven will be spoilt by sin or by evil. There'll be no litter, no pollution, no evil, no wars, no terrorism, no murder, no abductions or rapes, no broken relationships, no sadness or anger or gossip or selfishness. Nothing to cause pain or heartache or mourning. Instead of familiar loss and dissatisfaction and frustration, there will be unquenchable joy, satisfied fulfillment, unadulterated thankfulness, and contented well-being. This is our inheritance, and it's being stored up for us in heaven, treasure which moth or rust cannot destroy, where thieves do not and cannot break in and steal. Peter says to his weary fellow believers, rejoice, rejoice because Jesus has risen and is alive and has gone on to his father's home to get your inheritance ready for your homecoming. Keep that thought of your glorious future in mind when you're struggling with present day hassles and heartache. And that's where Peter really finishes off. He's realistic enough to know that the past is the past and the future is still to come. And however great and glorious they both may be, what about now for these struggling, scattered disciples who have been ruthlessly uprooted from their homes and they find themselves the targets of discrimination and attack? the the grueling rough and tumble of the, the here and now, the present day. It's not easy to take. So, verses 5 to 9, Peter gives them three little nuggets of truth to cling on to just for now so that they can rejoice. Not because of their suffering. Peter's not a masochist, but rather so that they can rejoice even in their suffering when again they keep their hearts set on the God of their salvation and their eyes fixed on Jesus, the perfecter of their faith. Firstly, know that God will keep you and protect you through each day. Verse 5, He will shield you by His power until Christ is revealed on that final glorious day of His reappearing. In other words, He will not take his eyes of you. He watches over your coming and going. He is your shield and your protection. Sometimes God very clearly and directly protects us from either physical or spiritual danger, and we're very well aware of it. And sometimes He protects us, and we're blissfully unaware of it. And sometimes he does allow us to suffer injury or attack because we're not saying that bad things never happen to Christians. Of course they do. Christians take ill, they get hurt, they suffer pain and broken relationships, they suffer financial hardship, they suffer loss and bereavement. But it's in those moments of suffering that he stays with us, he watches over us, he gives us grace and courage and faith to cope. It's as if he puts a protective hedge around us to shield us from the worst effects of the pain and the loss and the emptiness. So, no matter what we may ever have to endure, 
Know that God will never leave us. He will always hold on to us. He will carry us through to the end. This is our living hope, that we're shielded by God's resurrection power until his salvation is fully revealed in the last time. Secondly, verse 6, know that whilst our current struggles may often feel like they are never ending, they are temporary. Peter writes about suffering grief and all kinds of trials for a little while. Weeping may remain for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So remember that even the very worst and most prolonged of our trials and challenges are not the end game. There is a new world order coming when the old order of things shall pass away and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. And thirdly, verse 7, remember that God permits us to undergo fiery-type trials to refine and to strengthen our faith. It's His way of working all things together for our spiritual good, for bringing His goodness to us, even in the most difficult, heartbreaking, and even evil situations. Peter uses here the illustration of a lump of raw gold placed into a fiery furnace and melted down so that all the impurities dislodge and then can be skimmed off, leaving the gold refined and pure. And if gold is precious, then Peter's saying here, your faith is of even greater worth. Even gold can't last forever, but God has set eternity in our hearts, and is designed that we do live forever. And his desire for us is that we will thrive and flourish in faith, albeit in a stop-start kind of way here and now, with sin tempting us and leading us astray, until we enter his glorious presence and we stand before him completely pure and spotless, and we're able to give him unadulterated praise and glory and honor. Of course, we'll never enjoy the scars and the wounds of the hard knocks. But those are the times when we really learn how to turn to God and we lean on Him like never before. And we're often truly amazed as we see Him graciously working and giving us the sufficient grace and just enough daily strength to face the struggles. And inevitably, we draw closer to Jesus as we draw from Him, and we grow stronger and more convinced in our faith than ever. I wonder, can you relate to any of this? Rather than blaming God for the bad times, you see them actually as faith-strengthening and faith-refining experiences, and times when you become most thankful for Jesus without trivializing any of the sorrows or struggles you're currently facing, let me encourage you to hold on to the words there of verses 8 and 9 as we close this morning. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you don't see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. These days are tough, folks. Keep on trusting. Keep holding on to Jesus. Maybe you need to start trusting in Jesus for the very first time today. Start trusting and keep trusting, and He will see you through to the end and beyond, stronger and purer than ever. When all else fails, at least we can rejoice in Jesus, His salvation past, present, and future. That is our certain truth, our living hope. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, thank You again for Your Word, for its clarity, for its challenge. Thank You that this is Your Word, 
And your word this morning gives your people hope and confidence in Christ alone. He is our risen King, our living hope. Thank you that you have given us new birth into a living, loving, dynamic, never-ending relationship with Jesus, both here and now, in this life of struggle, and in the next, when we'll claim our inheritance, which will never perish, spoil, or fade. Lord, we are thankful for your gracious provision. Your grace is utterly beyond measure. We confess, though, Lord, sometimes in the daily grind, we don't always feel the joy. So will you give us today fresh hope, renewed resilience, and a heavenly perspective on our earthly struggles and battles, and help us all to turn to you and to trust in you for everything and ultimately for our own eternal security and salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, we conclude our service this morning with this great hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and Righteousness. No merit of my own I claim, but a holy trust in Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. Let's stand, and we'll sing praise to our God.
Let's say the grace together. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.